there is a new small clinical trial that suggests saline infusions may help with myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, or ME-CFS. So let's take a look and see if there's anything interesting in this new clinical trial. First, let me give you the one minute version of the rationale. So to do anything, you must have sufficient blood reaching your brain. So you have oxygen reaching your brain to perform all cognitive functions. So without having adequate blood and therefore adequate oxygen to your brain, you will be unconscious in seconds. Now, when you're lying down, it's pretty easy for your body to get that necessary oxygen to your brain as long as your blood is well saturated with oxygen. But when you stand up, gravity has a significant effect on your blood. It will pull the blood away from the brain and into your abdomen and into your lower extremities. And so if we didn't have some mechanism to counter the effects of gravity on the brain, we would all pass out every time we try to stand. Now, fortunately, we do have a system. It starts with the bare receptors, not bare receptors, it's bare receptors. And these detect the drop in blood pressure and initiate a response that involves your brain, your autonomic nervous system, your heart, your blood vessels, and they all work together to keep the oxygen supply to your brain level. And then other systems take over if you're standing for longer periods of time. But if you have a problem with one part of this compensatory system, you may have insufficient blood and insufficient oxygen reaching your brain when you change posture. And then your symptoms are going to be created or exacerbated, things like fainting, uh, dizziness, cognitive issues, fatigue, anxiety, muscle weakness, and there's there's like a couple dozen more possible symptoms. All right, so here comes the saline infusion. All right, saline is put into your body with an intravenous catheter or an IV catheter. And by putting that saline into your body, you increase your blood volume. And that hopefully allows your heart to be more efficient at pumping the blood to your brain and getting the oxygen to your brain, thereby reducing the symptoms. So I wouldn't expect this treatment procedure to work on all ME-CFS sufferers. It would help those in particular who have some kind of problem with posture. So they may have um, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or POTS, um, may have orthostatic hypotension, which is a drop of blood pressure when you stand, or maybe hypovolemia, which is insufficient blood volume. All right. So, so again, I don't think most ME-CFS patients fit one of these three conditions, but a lot of them do. So it is relevant to talk about. All right, let's see what this group did. So the paper I'm showing you right now, uh, it is called Beneficial Effects of Intermittent Intravenous Saline Infusion in Dysautonomic Patients with Myalgic Encephalomyelitis, Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, a case series. All right, this is an open access paper, so you can grab it yourself. The link is in the video description, and this was conducted by a Swedish uh, medical research group. Now, they did saline infusions every three weeks for nine weeks. So the participants got three different treatments, again, separated by three weeks. Now, the study didn't have a placebo or a sham, so everyone knew that they were getting the active treatment, which again is saline. Uh, they infused an average of 1,600 milliliters of saline per treatment. And that's, I mean, that's basically what, what the treatment is. You put in the IV needle, you slowly infuse the saline, and, and that's it. Now, the participants met the Canadian consensus criteria for MECFS, and they also had to have signs of dysautonomia, like autonomic nervous system disorder or hypervolemia. Now, they enrolled 40 people, but 18 of those people stopped early because they had an issue attending all the sessions. And that leaves 22 participants. And that's a pretty 
small sample size. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now they did a table tilt test, which is a standard test for orthostatic intolerance. And then they also gave a questionnaire of symptoms like brain fog and pain and dizziness and all the things I mentioned before. And they took the scores from all of those questions and they calculated kind of an overall composite severity score. Now I didn't see a reference for this score, so I think they created this process themselves. It, it was a research team kind of in-house score. Uh, I might have missed it, but I didn't see a reference. So I'm not sure if the score they're using is an accurate way to determine overall severity. It's always best to use a well-validated outcome tool, but um, in any case, that's what they used in it. It kind of makes sense. It's basically the, the patient's rating the severity of related symptoms. So let's look at how saline affected that composite severity score. Here's the figure. I believe this is figure one. And um, it shows the drop in severity as the treatment starts. So at the very bottom, I'm putting here in a red arrow, this is the severity at treatment start. So the higher the score, the worse the severity. Then we see the reduction of severity at three weeks. Then we see a very slight reduction at six weeks. And then we see a further reduction at 10 weeks. The overall reduction from start to finish, kind of eyeballing it, is around 28%. And so a 28% reduction of severity. And it was statistically significant at P less than 0.001. Now, while these graphs, uh, I think these are pretty clear. I think it's uh, they, they look like reasonable and real plots with real data. So I would have liked to have seen what we call a spaghetti plot. I'm showing you an example here. This allows me to see the response of each patient. Again, this is an example from another study. So these aren't real data. I just want to show you what a spaghetti plot looks like. It, it's just it allows you to see kind of how real patients respond on an individual basis. And it just provides a little more information. Now, when you have 100 people, you can't do it because it's too messy. But when you only have 20 or so patients, it's pretty easy to do a spaghetti plot. But anyway, I just wanted to make a note of that. It's a judgment call on how to show the data. So it's not really a, a criticism. Now, uh, the research team, they also did other tests. They didn't just do the composite score. They did tests on POTS severity, quality of life, and working ability. And they reported statistically significant improvements on all of those. And you, if you want to see those, you can grab the paper and take a look at those scores as well. Now, if I read the paper correctly, only one person reported the treatment as actually harming their quality of life. So not many reports of adverse events, but as I mentioned briefly before, 45% of the patients fail to finish the protocol. And that is a significant dropout rate. And that is concerning in any kind of clinical study. This isn't really a clinical trial. It's a case series, but still you, you would want to have more people get through the whole protocol. So the fact that so many people dropped out, uh, there's a lot of reasons. It could suggest they had some other issues or problems with the treatment. Could be that there wasn't enough effort into calling them and getting them back for the future sessions. It could be the lack of a beneficial response. It could be that it was just impractical to do this logistically, like it could be too hard to visit the clinic every three weeks when you have this condition. Um, all those are, are possible. So what do I think overall? All right, again, they called this a case series study. You can also call it a signal finding study. It's tiny. It's just large enough to see if there's anything interesting to warrant further research. So it just gives you an idea, is it worth doing a bigger study and investing all that time and all that money. So I do think it's wise to do these small studies first. I do these every time. I always do a small study to see if there's anything interesting. And then based on that, I may do a larger study. 
So good for finding a signal, but it absolutely is not large enough or well controlled enough to change clinical practice. So you shouldn't really take this paper and say, hey, we need to start giving saline to people with ME-CFS. It's, it's too mature to do that. In order to change clinical practice, we need larger trials. We also need a trial with a placebo or a sham control. So right now we have no way of knowing how much of this improvement was due to just expectancy or placebo effect. We don't know how much of the improvement was due to the treatment, and we need to know that. Now, you can do a sham in a study like this. For a saline study, I would probably, uh, what I would probably do is I would insert the IV into the arm, and then you would have one line from the saline bag or from the saline infusion machine flood that line with saline and have another line going to a reservoir that the patient can't see. And then you can use a little lever, a little switch to either put the saline into the patient or into the reservoir. And you can do that in a way where the patient doesn't know the difference. And that way you can run it into the reservoir when you want to do placebo. And so that's why you can sham control this process where you can control for um, expectancy. So I hope that makes sense. So there's, there's almost always a way to do some kind of sham where people don't know if they're getting the real treatment or not. All right. So, uh, and if they do another study, I suspect they'll do something like that. So they control for expectancy. All right. So other thoughts, uh, the use of intravenous saline in these patients makes good theoretical sense. IV saline is better at increasing blood volume than just drinking water because of how your body handles water that's going into your gut and how much of that fluid goes into cells versus stays outside of the cells and what part of it goes into the plasma. And so IV saline is superior at actually increasing your blood volume. So it will work better than just, hey, drink some water or something. Other issues, part of it is logistic. You know, if you have to go to the clinic every three weeks, that could be difficult. This is not something that's going to cure the condition. And so if you are using saline as a chronic treatment, you're going to be doing this for years, I would suspect. I don't know that for sure. We'd have to look at the data, but we would think it's something that you would have to do pretty frequently because your body's pretty efficient at hitting its set point of fluid retention. And so you would have to do this pretty often or otherwise you'll be back to where you were before. That's what we'd suspect anyway. Now it is possible, I think if you were doing this for years, um, it is possible to do these things at home, but there are risks to that, such as doing the IV wrong and introducing a pathogen into your bloodstream. So someone needs to be good at finding a vein and maintaining proper aseptic techniques. And not everyone can do that safely. So it's best if you're doing it at home to have a nurse come to do the IV and do that saline infusion. So just based on this study, and there are a couple of older studies, but they're very small. There's never been a big study to my knowledge. But just looking at this new study, I would say, just again, just from a scientific perspective, I would say wait until a larger and placebo-controlled study is conducted. This just isn't enough to warrant trying it. But having said that, this is always ultimately a decision between a patient and a doctor. So yes, you could take this paper. Again, you can, you can pull it. It's open access. You can take it to your doctor and you can talk about it especially if you've tried everything else and they haven't worked. Saline infusions are pretty easy to do in the clinical environment. Not that difficult. Your physician may want you to see a dysautonomia expert, and those are usually neurologists, because you'll probably have to do some tests to establish that you have orthostatic intolerance, because you really need that to justify trying saline. If you don't have any kind of orthostatic intolerance, the saline is very unlikely to help you. Uh, and again, if I, if I remember the numbers, most people with ME-CFS do not meet orthostatic intolerance 
criteria or pots, but many of them do. So you just have to find out for yourself, which is the case with you. So uh, overall, it's a very interesting, minimally invasive treatment option. Uh, it looks like it can reduce symptom severity in a subset of MECFS patients. And I look forward to seeing a larger and a better controlled study. And thank all of you for watching. I hope this information is useful. And uh, I hope you can come back for the future updates.